Well, here we are, and we're about to start our Introduction to Philosophy course once again. And this time we're going to be continuing our in-class involvement um, in the course. So today, just like we left off with last time, we're going to pick back up with logic. Now, if you recall, if you don't, that's okay. Um, but I'd made the remark that I should have just waited until and said all of that. <laughs> what I said in the very last, almost to the almost to a T, the last seven minutes of the last lecture. <clears throat> should have just went ahead and included that, uh, included all that information here. That's okay. We got a lot of the the prelim, uh, preliminary, very important uh, things out of the way, but nevertheless, it laid them down. If you want to, you can listen to the last seven minutes again um, of the last lecture if you want to do that. Um, however, having said that. Now we can start um, our our journey into the uh, into into uh, the classroom discussion with our intro to logic here. So, without further ado, let's roll it. All right, I'm not going to tell you. Y'all have to go there. All right. So we talked about logic and why it's important, right? Now, what we're going to do in this class is I want to honestly, logic deserves its an, it deserves an entire course, like a whole course in logic. Yep. So we're going to have to run like roughshod through this and just ramrod through it because I want to get to the part of logic that will be fun for you guys. And when I say fun, I mean like good. So we're, I'm kind of using that term loosely there. Um, but at the same time, it really, I think it is fun too, because this is the kind of stuff again that you can turn around and look on, you know, Facebook or, you know, whatever the stuff is you play on or look on the news and you'll see a lot of these um, being committed on a daily basis. Um, and the point of these things that I'm going to show you, they're called informal fallacies, informal logical fallacies. And so when, you'll switch, when you see these, the point is to be able to recognize a bad and or crappy argument when you hear one of these fallacies being invoked. Um, and again, like one of the reasons that we're talking about this is because, again, our, our guy Aristotle, when he was, you know, back in the, all right, look, a long time ago, you had... You had the guys that were interested in the truth, right? The and then you line. had guys who wanted to help people to be able to argue and basically, and I'm, I'm being a little general here. I'm kind of oversimplifying to some, to some extent, but for the most part, it's generally speaking the case. So you've got guys called the sophists, and then you've got guys like Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates that were all in the same camp. Now you had the sophists that, were, that would try to convince people and argue people into the belief, like like a lot of the stuff that we hear now, like truth is relative, morality is relative, all these sorts of things. Those guys would argue in that camp. This is where the term sophistry comes from, right, the sophist. So you would have people, those guys that would argue those things. You had Plato, Aristotle, Socrates that would argue the opposite side. Um, that would try to argue for some of these core, hardcore philosophical concepts. Now, a lot of the, the tactics that the sophists would use were, very, are, were and are very, very, very influential um, in regards to the public, in regards to, you know, and I'm not saying this pejoratively, but to, in regards to laymen, because laymen a lot of times would have a hard time seeing through some of the, what now are called fallacies or fallacious missteps in reasoning. And so Aristotle was like, why is it that this stuff works so well in regards to people? And so, and again, I'm, being a little simplistic here, but for the most part, this is the case. So essentially, he sits down and he says, all right, look, I've noticed that this particular tactic is used often in arguments, and it's wrong because, and he goes through it. So then he'll say, so then he notices these guys, and he notices people being swayed by this or that argument that they're giving, and he's like, That's, that doesn't logically follow. That, that, that won't work. That's not sound. But that's a tactic that, again, is being used and it's swaying people heavily. I'll call that this, you know, or not necessarily he calls it this, but, you know, it's called this, I'll name that tactic or this fallacy this. So the point of naming these fallacies, and when I say fallacy, what do I mean? <laughs> Lie. Lie. Right, we're a misstep in reason, right? Like there's a misstep. Now, when we talk about this part, we're going to, this is the part we're going to fly through up here because you've got formal fallacy. Cameron, oh, I was just about to say that you weren't here ever again. So this right here 
it, this right here that we're going to talk about, this is the formal stuff. So you'll have formal fallacies. And formal fallacies, again, what are fallacies? They're missteps in reasoning. So formal fallacies are going to be your like rules, so to speak, like your 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 like technical rules of logic that are broken. Meaning like, <clears throat> you know, when you make a mistake in math, if you accidentally carry your one or something like that when you're supposed to not do that, whatever the case may be. That's like an official rule, right, of mathematics. And if you break that, your 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 answer can get screwed up, right? Just but just by virtue of it of, of you breaking a, a very uh, specific formal rule of mathematics, right? So just quickly, you have formal rules of logic and you have informal rules. So you have formal fallacies, you have informal fallacies. Formal fallacies are the rules, again, the rules of logic. We don't have time to go into that here. I'm going to mention it on the, um, on the, uh, in the classroom here. Go over a little bit of that so you get a little flavor of it. But what we're going to concentrate again for the most part on is the informal rules. And we'll get to that in a second with our slides as well, both of those. You can have that in philosophy too, in logic. You can have a formal rule that's broken that can almost, not always, but then, but that can always show that your argument is wrong. But even if it doesn't show it's wrong, if you break a formal rule, it can't, it's not necessarily right. Like your conclusion is not necessarily the case. Even if it's true, it's not, nece it's not necessarily true if you've broken one of these formal rules, right? Meaning the argument doesn't necessarily follow. If you've broken a formal rule, even if the conclusion is correct, the argument itself is is invalid. It doesn't get you to that that to that particular conclusion if a formal rule has been broken. But what we're talking about right now are these informal rules, which are just mistakes, just lapses in reason. And this is what I'm talking about that I want to fly through this stuff to get to that to show you um, how often that you'll be able to see this stuff and use this stuff, um, and again, the stuff that Aristotle saw that was so just persuasive among the crowds, um, why sophists were able to convince large numbers of people, and why sophists, even in our day, they're called politicians and lawyers and college professors. I'm just kidding, that's a swipe at all those three, but it's no way. But anyway, while a lot of those tactics are still very, very persuasive, um, and you'll see, you'll, you'll think, oh man, like I probably believe half of this stuff my whole life, or maybe some conclusion based off an informal logical fallacy that really is just a complete misstep in reason. And uh, I say that because all of us have felt afraid of that, especially before you you get to see, uh, basically, quote, let's put it poetically, that your the, the error of your ways is exposed, right, by Aristotle, something like that. So having said that, let's look at these quick. All right, when we talk about logic, we've already talked about how logic is just basically what? Just order of thought, right? It's just putting your thoughts in order to make sure that they make some sort of sense, right? Not some sort of sense, but to make sure they make sense. Like, we're going to do the right, we're going to think right. Now, can you get away from logic? We already talked about it. No, why? Because just the way you are, by nature of, just by essence of what you are as a human being, what are you going to do? You're going to use it, right? You're going to use it, right? The question is, is, is just what? Right, or if you're using logic poorly or, or, or effectively or rightly, right? Something like that. So, if logic just is ordered thought, just is, you know, your, your, your thoughts put in order in, in a reasonable fashion, you're going to, it's going to break down into all these little categories. You know, this is what we're going to fly through. You've got deductive reasoning. Right, these are going to be your major types of reasoning. And again, there's other stuff, but we're just covering the basics to try to get through this. So you've got deductive reasoning, and we'll kind of talk about that in a second. You've got inductive reasoning, and you've got, and we really won't talk about this much, so on, because really these are our two main ones. But then you also have what you have what's called an abductive reasoning, which is going to be a sub branch of this, really. And so the reason that we're only talking about this is just because you use this so often that it's at least worth mentioning. All right, now, does anybody have any clue as to what deductive reasoning might be? Go ahead, Piper. Well, no, but that at least that's an educated response, right? That, and, and what you're saying, if we cash that out, it might fit a little more line with it this year. But let's see, does anybody, anybody want to take a stab at deductive? Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, I think it may be 
where you have like uh, several different uh, draws and you can kind of narrow them down. Like in what sense? You have several different thoughts and you narrow them down to one in what sense? Right. So like if you uh, were trying to find, you know, a reason for something, you have several different things that you think that it could be as far as the way something happened. All right, this that's actually going to be this here, okay. and we'll get to that. That's a decent explanation of abductive reasoning, and we'll get to that in a second. So, back to DW deductive, all of these are supposed to get you to certain conclusions, right? Like when you when you're using using some sort of reasoning process, you're trying to get to what a conclusion, right? You're not trying to get to you know confusion. You're trying to get to a conclusion, right? That rhyme, I mean, that's awesome. All right, so deductive reason, what type, what kind of conclusions do you think these get you to? Or at least supposed to get you to? What's that? Not scientific per se. I mean you may have you may arrive at a scientific conclusion, but this is going to get you to what? Certain conclusions. These conclusions, when you're talking about deductive reasoning, the conclusions you get from a deductive argument. And here's the word we used this earlier, but syllogism. This is just going to be your logical or this is your philosophical jargon for argument. Like the structure of an argument is a syllogism, right? So instead of saying argument, you may say, you know, you've got to put together some sort of syllogism for this, which is just to say, you've got to put your argument, you've got to give your argument a structure, and it's going to be a syllogism. So isn't that just a fun word to say? It's syllogism. All right, so deductive, these are supposed to give you certain conclusions. Meaning that if this argument works, the conclusion has to what? It has to follow. It has to follow like night follows the day, right? Whether you like it or not, this argument, if it works, is what? It's just true. The conclusion has to be true. What if you don't like the conclusion? Shut up, sucker. Doesn't right? matter. Doesn't matter. Now, inductive arguments, how do you think these work? And we'll get we'll go we're gonna go back to this too. I'm just kind of doing the, the highlights first. How do you think these type of arguments work? Inductive arguments. Probably not even end up using that thing over there. I make I don't I hate PowerPoints. I made finally made a PowerPoint, I probably wouldn't use it. Alright, so how do you think these work? Inductive arguments. If these you if these wield certain conclusions, what do you think these try to do? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a conclusion. It's uncertain. <laughs> so we don't want to, even though philosophically speaking, that's true, right? But what, we don't want to say it that way. That makes sense. We just don't even know what you're talking about. Probable conclusions, right? So inductive, inductive reasoning is going to give you something like a probable or more likely conclusion, right? Does that mean that it's 100% true? That it has to be true? No, right? But if you, but you want, so but you want to try to shoot for what? You want to try to shoot for, you know how people say, to use the common vernacular, 99.9% .9 sure, right? Now you can't always get there, right? You may say, this only yields, you know, 70% certainty, something like that. Um, now how you would get to that, how you arrive at all these goofy percentages and all that, you might use something called Bayes theorem. We're not even worried about all that. So, abductive reasoning, like Barrett was saying back here, is this is when abductive reasoning is going to be Sort of a quasi mesh between these two. Bringing induction. Why? If I walk into a room and I see, you know, maybe a popular example is I see a bunch of red stuff on the floor, right? And I see a knife laying on the floor and I see a body laid on the floor. Now, what I'm doing when I see all of that, actually, you tell me, what am I doing when I see those things? Well, maybe I'm not drawing conclusions yet. For, what am I doing first? But right, I'm just observing what, what are seemingly just facts, right? The, there's a, the fact is there's red stuff in the floor, right? Now, does that say anything by itself? By itself, doesn't say anything, right? But when I look at red stuff in the floor, the body in the floor, the knife or whatever, I start to put all these, these data points together, right, to try to arrive at what? Some sort of conclusion, right? So adductive reasoning is when I look at multiple pieces of evidence or multiple pieces of data and I try to arrive at some sort of uh, uh, 
plausible or justified conclusion based on those things, right? Does that make sense? So this is the kind of stuff, say, like in a court case, that maybe type of reasoning maybe you say you say, all right, do you have a video of my client, uh, you know, stabbing this woman in her kneecap? No, I don't have a video of a woman stabbing her kneecap. Well, how do you know she did it then? Well, because of, and then they, what do they do? We've got, you know, this, we've got this, 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 this. So you, you put all of these pieces together to try to do what? To arrive at a particular conclusion, right? Now, if you did have video of a woman getting stabbed in the kneecap, you know, why she would be stabbed in the kneecap, obviously, who freaking knows, that she got stabbed in the kneecap. Now, if you did have a video of that, that would just be more what? Another piece of data that you add to your other data to try to get to what? That particular conclusion, right? Now, does that mean that conclusion is 100% true? Not necessarily. Again, philosophically, now, for all practical purposes, it's true, right? But when we say necessarily, we mean that it can't possibly be any other way, right? Now, which, which type of argument is it can't possibly be any other way, right? So, all right, let's go, let's start here. What's your classical example of a deductive argument? So I can show you what it means to say that, it, it, that, it, that if, if your premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. What's the classic example? Anybody know? Of course you don't. I'm just kidding. Right? That's the intro to the class. If you knew all that stuff, you'd be up here teaching it, right? All right, so your classical example of a deductive argument. Let me get this stuff out of the way. <clears throat> Does anybody want to write that down? Here you go. All right, your classical example is this. The first premise, and this is called a categorical syllogism. What do I mean by categorical? The entire category is involved, right? It means it's supposed to cover the breadth of it. And now your deductive arguments are supposed to go from what? General, general type statements to what? Think of an upside down triangle. What's that? That's right, to a very specific conclusion, right? Supposed to go to general type observations and get down to a what? Specific conclusion that yields what kind of certainty? Necessary certainty, right? Has to be true. Or certain. Right? <laughs> now this is going to be the opposite. You start in particulars, specifics, and try to get down to what? General conclusions, right? Some sort of general type statement. This is the opposite. You're starting from the general, you're going down to the particular. Here you're starting, excuse me. Just for clarification sake there, general to specific is deductive reasoning, and specific to very general type statements is inductive reasoning. Just in case you can't see, um, well, because you couldn't see what was going on in the classroom there. Starting in particulars, you're getting down to the general. Well, you'll see how this works. See, it's not that hard. Philosophy cat. And again, and, and you can also go from a general to a general, and you go from to a specific to a specific on this end of here. But generally speaking, general specific, specific to general. All right, so your categorical syllogism is going to have two premises and a conclusion. This is your premise. How do you recognize a conclusion? And this is your premise. Conclusion. They'll always have words like, well, therefore, or you'll say, Right, or in conclusion, or you'll say, so, you'll say, blah, 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 so. Uh, when you hear that, those are your keywords that are tripping you off or triggering you off to let, to let you know that somebody's giving you a conclusion. Now, <clears throat> your job is to what? All that stuff they were rambling on before is supposed to at least provide what? That's supposed to provide the premises, right? That's supposed to be, give, that's supposed to be the legs for which the stool's standing on, right? So, the legs for this conclusion we're about to get to is this. All men are mortal. First premise. All men are mortal, right? Socrates is a man. Second premise. What's the conclusion? What's that? All right, therefore, Socrates is what? Mortal. Now let me show you this with a little picture right quick. See how you make how this would make sense. Well, first we'll talk about down to that. All men are mortal. 
that's a general statement, right? That's that's based off what a, a, an observation, right, about reality. Right? We'll talk about that in a second. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Do you see? Do you see why that has to be? If this if this is true, because here's the key. Remember, can this be false? Yes, this can possibly be false. We have to argue for that. Is this false, or can it be false to me? The second premise. Can your second premise be false? Socrates is a man. Yeah, well, that, that, we might have to argue for that. But the key is, if, listen, this, this is huge, if this is true, if this first premise is true, all men are mortal, and if this is true, Socrates is a man, if these two premises are true, then this has to be true. Does that make sense? Somebody object to that if you really want to, if you have a question. Because I want you to see that this has this has to be true whether you like it or not. You can't say, well, again, like all that goofy crap we're going to do, well, it's true for you, and all that silly stuff. Right? This has to be true if this is true. Now, you may reject this. You may say, no, this is false. But what will you have to do to show this conclusion is false? What do you have to do? <clears throat> right? But how do you do that? Right, you just show that one of these aren't necessarily true, right? Because if one of these is not necessarily true, if this is not true, then what happens to the conclusion? Right, could this still possibly be true? Yes, but your argument doesn't work, right? You've at least shown, well, I'm rejecting your conclusion because one of your premises is faulty, because one of your premises isn't true, right? Or doesn't seem, even seem to be true in some sense. All right, so here's the way you can see the, the ease of this. All men are mortal. I'm going to say this circle represent all men, right? And everything, so since, and this is morality right here, or not morality, mortality. All men are mortal. Here's your other circle. So what I'm doing right here is I'm just drawing circles on the board. So imagine one circle represents all men, right? And then one circle represents all things that are mortal. And then one smaller circle represents Socrates, so if you've got the big circle that represents all things that are mortal, and then you have the smaller circle that says all men, because they're in that circle, all things that are mortal, men are in that. And then if Socrates is a man, well, he's in that circle. So then you would see how Socrates is mortal. The particular Socrates would have to be in the larger circle of all things that are mortal. That's what I'm drawing on the board there. It's called Euler circles. Sometimes people use Venn diagrams. Just a, it's just a tool in logic illustrative tool to help you figure things out in logic. So everything within this circle is mortal, right? Does that make sense? All men are mortal, so it's in the circle. Socrates, here's your last. Socrates. Socrates therefore, Socrates is mortal. You see how that fits in? If this is, if this is represents everything that has mortality, or in this case, men, and this represents humanity, which is in that thing, which is in the circle of everything that's mortal, and then Socrates is in that, you see how that has to follow? Because he's just in everything that's mortal, right? Does that make sense? So watch how this works. This is, again, I wish we had time to go through this, but we don't. But this is, again, the brilliance of Socrates. You can look at these, because, because none of the formal rules are broken here. And again, I'll just mention these quickly. Like some of the formal rules are you have to have three and only three terms. Um, if your if your conclusion is uh, distributed, then it has to be distributed in your in your premises. Um, you can't anyway. You don't need to worry about that right now. But anyway, because none of the formal rules are broken, this and if these are true, and since none of the formal rules are broken, this has to be true. You can see this with letters. Watch. You don't even have to know. This is the bread of Aristotle. We can say, look, I have to know what your argument is, and I can tell you if it'll if it if it'll work or not in regards to. Uh, at least the reasoning process. So, if A, if A is B. So, <clears throat> what I'm doing here is I'm just, you'll figure it out, but I'm just substituting uh, letters for those particular terms that were in your uh, syllogism here. All men, P, mortal, Q, Socrates, R, man, P, uh, Socrates, R, mortal, Q, same. Same as what I use in the premise up here. You're going to see how that works. It's crazy. Um, I'm giving a different example right now, but just stick with it and you'll see. B is, or let's say it this way, if A is equal to B, 
if b is equal to c, then what has to be true about c and a? Right, you have to know what a is? No, you have to know what c is? You have to know what b is? No. If it's tr if this is true that a is equal to this and a is b is equal to this, if those are just true, then you know that this has to be what? It has to be. You don't have to know what these are. Right? You can, so right here, in this syllogism that we just made, this categorical syllogism, all men are mortal, this one. If you put all men and substitute it all B R, we'll say M. Let's put P so we'll be confused. Instead of men, we'll put P for people. All, if all P are M, mortal, right? Using different letters here, so don't get confused by that. Same principle. I'm just using different letters there in the classroom than I did here on this slide. Right. So I get like here. <coughs> all P, if all P are M, and S, and S is a what? M. Then S is what? This way. S is M. Right? So Aristotle would say, look, I don't even know what these are. If all P is M, all S is M, then S has to be M. And again, that's just by nature of this all good. It's What's that? Should it be S? It looks good. It looks like we're well, no, because S falls within that. S falls no, within no, this here. No, we're changing the end of D. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So he, well, he has to be this here. Right. Because he is this. So S, we'll put in parentheses. Yeah. We'll put P in parentheses. Because he is one of those that falls in P, right? He just he is one of those. He's just an instance of all of this thing here. So over here, A is equal to B, B is equal to C, therefore A is equal to C. That's valid inference, right? That's just the law of valid inference. So anyway, that's, your, that's a categorical syllogism. Now your next on this list of categorical syllogism is the hypothetical syllogism. <clears throat> what, what do you think, and this is almost self-explanatory. Hypothetical, how do you think that would be worded? Something like that, how do you think it would be worded? Usually these types of statements. If then. So really modus ponens. Arguments. Modus ponens and tollens arguments. And again, we're gonna try to try to flop <coughs> so we can get the more fun stuff. Hypothetical syllogism is slightly different um, than a modus ponens, modus ponens and modus tollens, just for clarification's sake there. Who thinks they can put an argument together with if then? And it's just because it's just again, it's just another form of argument, another form of deductive argument, which real, which is supposed to wield certain conclusions. What's another form? What's an, what's a form of this? Think about it. It's really not hard. Right. So, right. If I study, so if I study, let's put study. Up here. If I study, then I pass. Now again, we're not talking about, well, sometimes I know people that study and they don't, we're not talking about that. We're talking about if it's true that if you study, right? And if it's true that you study the past, then this will have to be, therefore, what? What do you have, well, what's missing here? What do we have to put in the middle here? We have to make something connect to these, right? If I study, then I pass. What can you say? What would you say right here in the middle? We already has to be a connector. We have clarity. We already What's that? Have here. Well, that's yeah, right. If it's true, but what do you want to say to make this argument connect? So we need something in between here, right? If I study, then I pass. I study, right? So therefore, what? I study, therefore, therefore I pass. Now, quickly to break the rule. One of the rules, if you, to break one of the rules is this here. What if you were to say, and you'll see why this rule works, again, why Aristotle's little rules on itself work. There were seven of them for the syllogism, categorical syllogism anyway. 
So if I study, then I pass. What if I say I pass? Does this follow? Therefore, I study. Does that follow? No. Why? You may have cheated, right? You may have done something else. See, and again, Aristotle, you can take all these words away and just put the letters there, and he would not the argument will follow. Because remember, this is called if, if I say I if I say if I study, then I pass. I pass. What I've done is broke the formal rule of called uh, I affirmed the, the consequent here. This is the antecedent. This side of the equation, so to speak, is the antecedent. This side of the equation on the then side is the consequent. So when you affirm the consequent, you break a rule of logic. And how, how do we, we know this intuitively, just like Joshua pointed out. Well, no, you may have cheated, or you may pass some other way. Again, did you, you didn't know that, but you already knew that, well, wait a minute, that doesn't necessarily follow. Because just because you pass doesn't mean you studied, right? right? And you can fill in, you can use all kinds of examples. So anyway, that's your hypothetical solution. We're trying, again, I'm trying to just pop through this stuff so we can get the more Interesting part. Now, the disjunctive syllogism, what does it mean to just to be disjunctive? What is a disjunct? Nobody knows what a disjunct is. Not even like logically speaking, just what is a disjunct? Like separation, right? This or this, right? All right, so a disjunctive syllogism would be either what? Either or, right? And again, you you even got very specific types of disjunctive syllogisms that we're not we're not going to talk about that. But usually speaking, I'm just giving you the, the general one here. So you would say something like either. Well, actually, when you, you guys give me an example, right? That would be that would be one of. The, We'll use it. We'll, we'll go ahead and use that one, even though we'll go ahead and use it. That's blue. Let's say, let's say it's green. Let's just say that, so I can point out something. Either the sky is blue or it's green. I don't want to make a grammatical error there. Or right, it's green. Either the sky is blue or green. All right, so. We know that the sky is blue, right? Unless it's like some kind of weird tornado. All right, so either the sky is blue or it's green. So how do you get to this conclusion? What do you have? What do you have to do here? What's that? Oh yeah, you look up. <laughs> but how do we make this argument work? How do we get the conclusion with this argument that the sky is blue? What do we have to do? Remember how we had to fill in the thing up here on the hypothetical one? If then, well, I studied then, therefore. So what do we have to do here to get to this argument? Get to this conclusion rather. We have to deny something, don't we? Go ahead, Piper. What do we have to do? Would be on the side of the group, therefore, it's not there. Right, actually, what we want to do, we, we, we can't, we don't want to, we don't want to, you have to deny one of your disjunct. In a disjunct syllogism, you have to deny. So you have to say either sky, either the sky is blue or it's green. It's not green. Therefore, What's your only other option? If it's disjunctive, you only have two options. It's not green, therefore what? It's blue. The rule, the formal rule here is when you affirm one of these two, you have to deny in order to get that conclusion. And again, if you think about that for a minute, you can see how if you affirmed one, it wouldn't necessarily follow. It wouldn't necessarily be true. Again, Aristotle would that you could do these with either P or Q. Not Q, therefore, that you see what I'm saying? You could do it with the letters. Now, that is the worst treatment ever that you'll ever hear on deductive, on, on deductive logic and that kind of stuff. But again, it's because this is an intro course, and I want you to get the meat out of what I think that you'll be able to use like in your life for you know an intro to philosophy course. So we can't spend a lot of time on that. Again, this is, you know, maybe in the future if they offer a whole course of logic, that'll be good, but right now they don't. So End up in logic. If this is supposed to go from general premises to very specific type conclusions that are certain, that are not at the whim of whether you like it or not, what was our inductive supposed to be? 
probable, right? So what's an, an example of an inductive argument? What's an example of one? If our example of a deductive is, well, all men are mortal, they're in Socrates a man, well, therefore he just has to be mortal. That's an example of deductive. deductive. So what would be an example of inductive type argument? Yeah, right. You're actually two steps ahead of where I was going to go because I went. I was going to pull that in later and be like, wait a minute, is this kind of tie a problem for our detective arguments? But since we're there, we'll go ahead and say it. What if I were to say, well, this guy dies, and this guy died, and you died, and he died, and everybody died, and that guy died, and this guy died? Well, you know what? All people must what? Everybody must die, right? <laughs> everybody dies, right? This guy died, he died, and that guy right there is dead. Everybody's dead. Everybody dies, right? Well, therefore, if, if Tom dies, and Bill dies, and Gary dies, and Hakushika dies, and so and so, well, then everybody what? Everybody what? Everybody must die, right? Now, is that logically certain? Is that logically tight? Is that logically follows from that Bill died? Bill died. Kaniqua died. Ted died. Everybody, all these guys died. Also, what you know? What I saw this. Everybody has to die. Logically certain. No. But is it improbable? Like, is it is it is it good to go around thinking? Well, I mean, I'm saying everybody dies, so I mean, I'll probably have to die. I mean, it doesn't mean I'll die. Yeah, it means you probably got a pretty good chance of dying, right? So, but is it lo logically so? Is it like this over here? No, it doesn't yield logical necessity, but it yields what probable, right? Now these these arguments, these inductive arguments, can be more or less what. They can be more or less what? They can be more probable or less probable, right? This is probably pretty probable, right? This conclusion is, is I mean, we've had a lot of observation on this over, over time, right? But what if a guy walks in the room with a black hat on, like Cameron by there, and another guy walks in with a black hat, another guy, is that black or gray? Yeah, I think it's gray too. All right, so let's say a guy walks in with a gray hat on, another guy walks in with a gray hat on, another guy walks in with a gray hat on, and let's say 15 guys walk in, and I say, the next guy comes in, I bet it's going to have a gray hat. That's inductive argument, right? But does that mean the, guy, the next guy that walks in will have a gray hat? No. Is it probable? Maybe. It's, it's more probable than saying the guy will walk in with a sombrero, right? Right? Because I have some reason, at least I have some reason to think that. But the guy, the next guy in Morgan may have on a green thong, right? I don't know. I mean, I hope not. Unless, I mean, you're probably not. I'm just kidding. Just taking on. So is it like, so it's like a form of a suit? Huh? It's like a form of a suit? Based on well, a suit might not be, that might be a little, might be a little pejorative because it's not just assuming, right? Because what is assuming? No, I mean, I'm not asking for like the, I'm not asking for that part thing. <laughs> What is assuming? Yeah, you know, you may, you may or may not have any reason to think that at all, right? So when we say that all men are going to die, are we, are we assuming that? Well, not really. I mean, we've got death there, right? We've got good reason to think that, right? Something like that. And why? Why do we think that? Why, what is our reason for that? Because we've watched five or six people die? No, like we've watched how many? Millions, right? Millions of people die. You know, probably even billions. I mean, I'm not saying that's like that's a good thing. I'm like, yes, I know it dies. Now we got more certainty. I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm trying to argue. So, just the point is that we've 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 got all of this observation, right? With that said, inductive reasoning leads to probable conclusions. Now, like Lacey pointed out. What does that do for our deductive argument? Because remember, all men are mortal. What, what was that? 
What was that? Say, so just continue what you were thinking on that. <laughs> Remember when you said, when I said, does this pose a problem for our deductive argument? Induction, and you said, well, what? You said, well, what? Is that, could that be flipped? You're on the right track. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what you're saying. No, that's fine. Remember what we were saying that all of Oh. His name was Lord be with him. Right. Right, but that's a probable conclusion, but not certain, right? Yeah. But then we're using that. Remember, because what's the deductive arguments are supposed to give you what kind of conclusions? Certain conclusions. Right. Well, so how, so the problem is, well, then how can you use this for deductive argument if this was based off what? This. Does that make sense? That's what I thought you were getting at when I said you were two steps ahead, is that's what I thought you were getting towards. Maybe you were, maybe you just kind of got off track there. But is that so? Does that does that pose a problem for this? Yeah. How so? How does that? Basically, what I was getting there, or getting to there, or getting at there, <laughs> if you're confused, was essentially I was saying, like, well, wait a minute. If the premises within each particular deductive syllogism, right? If those premises say for instance all men are mortal first premise second premise um socrates is a man that's our second premise um that's supposed to yield certain conclusions right what i was getting at here was just a very deep philosophy problem uh or at least much more deep than we could we need to go into here but basically what i was getting at there was if that first premise is all men are mortal the second premise is Socrates is a man. Well, how did we know that? Didn't we know that first premise? Isn't that first premise based off inductive reasoning? And doesn't inductive reasoning only yield probable conclusions? Meaning that how did I know uh, that all men are mortal? That's the first premise of the argument, right? Well, the first premise was all men are mortal, but I knew that inductively, right? So I was just kind of giving a taste of one of our more in-depth philosophical problems. Um, just in case you were confused there. Didn't really need to be mentioned here, but it's just one of those things that in logic we kind of worry over. Yeah, good question. I mean, just broadly. Good question. So I'm just going to go ahead and skip over that part right there. Right? If this is true, this is premise one. In your second premise of Socrates is a man. Because how did we arrive at this premise? Again, we arrived at this premise out. Again, I'm just saying, I'm just telling, going over exactly what I just said. We arrived at that by inductive reasoning, all that sort of thing. We arrived at it by this, did we not? Well, I know this is man, this is a 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 man, that's a man, that's a man, that's a man. Inductive reasoning. Thing, the arguer may say, is all I'm saying is if this is true and if this is true then this has to be true now if you're going to say but wait a minute you built off and off the you built these off induction which, which are just or just they're just probable but they're not certain then what can the argue or argue say there they might say that right him law to be exact but what might they say there or something else they can say all right stud show me why i should move this I'm going to say stud. Yeah, that's more of a southernism. Um, or they may say that, right? Or they may say, like, you know, all right, bro, show me this. Show me why I don't have reason to believe this right here. Right? So anyone can just say, well, this isn't, that, that's not, that, that's just a problem. That's just a problem. A problem. And then I'd say, right, but you've got to do what? Because Any, anybody can walk around and say what? Oh, I doubt this. I doubt this. Anybody can say that, right? So, 
a reason why I shouldn't think this. All right, Socrates is a freaking pink elephant dressed up like a man. Anybody can say that, right? Because is that logically possible? Yes, it's logically possible. But do I have any flipping reason to think that Socrates is a guy or is a pink elephant in a human mask? No. So no. you've got to give me a reason to think something like that. So in that sense, does that give up this? So in that sense, is that sort of a, is that a problem for deductive arguments? No, because just because something doesn't yield quote unquote logical necessity in that sense doesn't mean that now we can't give reasonable arguments, right? So if I were to say something like uh, Georgia Highlands satellite campus is in Douglasville, you're in the Georgia satellite campus. Georgia Satellite, they sang, they sang some old rock song, not so bad, Georgia Highlands College Satellite. Georgia Highlands College Satellite is in Douglasville. You're in, or you're on the campus of, what? The Georgia Highlands College Satellite. So therefore, what? You are what? In Douglasville. Now someone could say, is that, was that based off induction? Yeah, it's like I looked and saw where it was. All stuff. Someone might say, how do you know that Georgia, like right now, that map wasn't switched in Alabama? Like, do you have any reason to think that? Right. No. So does that pose a problem for induction? I mean, for dedu a deductive argument. Even though I observed that this campus is in Douglasville, you're in the campus, therefore you're in Douglasville. Is my argument really uh, in some sort of trouble because I, that's based off induction? Not really, right? The only people that really want to make that into a problem are, are, are modern philosophers since the Enlightenment era, especially a guy named David Hume. And we'll get into that when we talk about epistemology. Um, where are we in all this stuff? Anybody? <laughs> I don't know. Tell me. All right, so um, does anybody want to say something like that before I start to get into some of these informal fallacies? I'm What's that? I kind of did this in math. Right, yeah, logic is, is yeah. right. Logic is in a lot of ways, especially when you when you get into symbolic logic. We're not even, we're not getting full with symbolic logic. We're just looking at what's sometimes called classical or Aristotelian logic because this is essentially how you argue every day in your everyday life, right? And we would even say something like some symbolic logic in some way is going to depend on even old school classical and or slash Aristotelian type logic. Um, but yeah, it's related in a lot of ways. In fact, symbolic logic sometimes is just what people like to just pretend like it's just math logic. I don't want to say pretend, but essentially just call it mathematical type logic. But they're related, and you see how they're related, right? Especially if we had time to get into formal rules, especially just those letters, how they're highly related because you're almost working with an equation, right? It seems like anyway, in some sense, right? All right, now, let's get into, let me fast forward to put the little stuff. Introduction to logic and blah, 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 blah. See, man, like I made this little thing. Don't you kind of feel sorry for me? <laughs> That's not what I was, that wasn't the response I was thinking of the comment. Like when I was making that, I wasn't thinking, some dude in class will think this is really cute. <laughs> but hey, man, you know, I guess that's better than you saying it's ugly. All right, switching gears. All right, so now we're going to informal logic, right? And this is the stuff, again, I think this is what you'll like here. So very quickly, this is what I want you to get out of that, get out of this, these lessons in logic, these next two lectures. Um, we had, I know it was, you know, kind of difficult to slog through a lot of the other really you need 15 weeks to talk about logic as a whole. Um, but we had to do that. We had to go ahead and lay some of the groundwork about what logic is, what it isn't, you know, just I'll let you at least get a taste that, 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 that logic is um, about rules, about validity, um, those sorts of things. But this right here, this is where I really want you guys to pay attention. This informal fallacies, these informal fallacies involved in logic, because you don't have to have any training, um, in logic specifically to be able to get uh, usage, uh, to be able to employ, to be able to really get a lot of these, learning these informal fallacies in logic. 
So really pay attention. This is where I wanted us to go here. Like, oh crap, like I've done this so many times. Or you may be like, oh yeah, I knew that. Yeah, I, I always knew there was something wrong with that type of response, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. In fact, I didn't even know there was a name to it, but there is. So having said as much, <coughs> this is what's going to be I think, hopefully more fun here because you're going to get to see this stuff. All right, so I even set up here, switching gears now. See, I wrote it up there, switching gears. Informal fallacy. These deal with errors in reasoning. They're not related to the form of the syllogism. What do I mean by the form? Form is just the, the rules, right? Not related to the, oh, you have an undistributed middle term, or you didn't distribute the clip uh, like those, the rules. Remember the specific rules. These are just the, these are just the, what I said earlier about the mistakes, like why was Aristotle like, why, why was it when this guy says this, why is that so persuasive? That kind of stuff. So these aren't related to like the formal rules that we didn't have time to get into. And again, you don't have to know anything about the formal rules to know about these. This is why I'm going and giving you these. These are errors in thought, essentially. Remember mistakes or a lapse in reasoning somewhere. All right, there's two basic, and don't try to write all this unless you just want to, you don't have to. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to fly through this to get to the interesting part. <clears throat> There's two basic headings of inf informal fallacies, ambiguity and relevance. So what do you think ambiguity has to mean? Has so anything to do with it? <laughs> right, so what do you mean, what do you think it means? What, what, what do you mean by ambiguous? Right, like eh, your terms aren't very clear, right? Something like that. Like when I say terms, like all men are mortal. Like man is a term, mortal is a term, Socrates is one of your terms. And so that's when we get into the question, like, wait a minute, what do you mean by men? Do you mean like men and women, or do you mean like strictly a man, right? Stuff like that. Like it might be uh, unclear, like she says, just ambiguous, right? Or now, the other heading that most of these fall under is relevance. What do you think that means? <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, we had to use the word, the same word, but I mean, that's just the way to say it. Say it again louder, Josh, so everybody can hear you. Or it's right, it's exactly right. Like, this isn't relevant. Not relevant. Right? And you're going to be surprised at how many of these informal fallacies that you hear on a daily basis um, that are either ambiguous or just not relevant, even though they sound what? Right. They're going to, in fact, that's the trick behind these is they say, because anybody would say, what if you were arguing, what if uh, Amari was saying, you know, like, I've got class. After he, I gotta go to math class, whatever her class is. I gotta go to math class after that. And I say, you got on white tennis shoes. That's obviously what? That's obviously irrelevant, right? <laughs> like, what? That's irrelevant. But the trick is, people are gonna give these 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 fallacies, this, this fallacious type of reasoning. Nobody's gonna do it that way, right? Because nobody would fall for that, right? They're gonna do it in a way that sounds what? Relevant. Right, and you're, this is the kind of stuff you hear in court all the time. Court cases, again, from political figures, from your mom, dad, from your brother, from your sister, even even us. Even we've fallen prey to these, and hopefully, again, by seeing this, um, it pulls them out in the light. And it's fun to run around now saying, you know, you can run around and say genetic fallacy, argument ad populum, uh, argument ad baculum, and people are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, nothing. Just your argument doesn't follow at all. I'm just kidding. You won't be a jackass, but you're not going to. <laughs> all right, so ambiguity, meaning of statements is not clear. All right, you said that. You guys guessed that right. The reason for that was right. Relevance, meaning is clear, but it does not address the actual issue of the argument, meaning that what you just said is completely irrelevant. Another way to say ambig ambiguity is equivocation. Now, a fallacy of equivocation is when I mean one thing by one word, right? But then I what? Right, in a completely different way, even though it sounds like, now the, right, now an obvious example, again, you'd be more on default for this one, but it's just so obvious to make the meaning clear. Like if I were to say, well, hey, look guys, you know that, you know, I'm, I'm broke right now, or you're broke right now, right? Yeah, I'm broke. Right, we know you can solve that, how? Well, there's money in banks, right? All banks have money. So if you go down the river, there's, you know, a bank, and you can get some money. So what did I do there? Right, it's this exact same word, but what? 
It's completely different meaning. Now, would anybody be fooled by that? No, you have to be a goofball and say, oh, yeah, riverbank. And why I think there? All right, nobody would fall for that. But people don't do it that way, right? Because we're not, generally speaking, much morons, right? They do it in a more clever way. Well, but it's the same thing. They're not really meaning the same thing. That's what happens when somebody commits that informal fallacy of equivocation. They're mean, they mean something a little different, usually. If it's not a little different, it's completely different than what they're saying. Um, I wish I could give a popular example right now. Um, but I'm not because I want to fly. I want to get to some, I want to actually get to some of these because I was hoping we would get to these more quickly than we did. And we'll, we'll, can, we'll continue these later possibly or probably. Um, now again, accent, this is kind of a different one. And this is where stuff screws up on the internet. Like, have you ever been having a conversation on like some, like a Facebook post or something like that, or even possibly an email and like, you're like somebody gets, you know, pissed at you or mad at you or whatever, and you're like, no, 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 that's not what I meant by that. I mean, that can happen even in a regular talk, right? But how much more often does that happen in a text type environment? Why? And why does Right, so you don't see body language, you don't see all that, you don't, but one of the things that you really can't see is accent, right? Now, what do I mean by this right here? What do I mean by that? <laughs> do I? Is that really what I mean? Say that's just in text. Say I wrote this. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what? If, so what if I accent this word here? Right, so if I accent this word, what how does that sound? I love you. That that sound has a completely different meaning than what? I then if I accent this, right? I love you. That's a completely different meaning just based on which word I accent. Now can you pick that up in a text or Facebook or whatever? You've got good context to evaluate that. But just by itself. You, we can make mistakes in reasoning just based off what? Just accent or emphasis. Sometimes it's called emphasis. That's not really a big one, but we had to talk about it. All right, I'm going to kind of skip through these because I'm going to start to get to these. All right, now, we're, now fallacies of relevance. These are the, 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 the more interesting fallacies. And remember, these formal fallacies are informal fallacies. Informal. Why are they informal? Informal. Why are they not formal fallacies? Right, they're not breaking the rules, right? The rules may be completely right in your argument, but there's there's an, an informal, what we would say, mistake in your reasoning. Remember, fallacies of relevance, what do these have to do with? They don't address the issue, right? That's right, relevance, they don't have, they are not relevant. So the first one is, an these usually have an, a Latin type name. Now, I think Aristotle had somewhere around 11 or 13. All right, so, Pay attention. This is where we are. Whole thing of the course is to get here um, to talk about informal fallacies, right? Specifically, fallacies of relevance. Um, and we're not just arbitrarily choosing out, uh, fallacies of relevance. <coughs> it's rather, excuse me, that most fallacies committed are going to be fallacies of relevance. When you get into an argument, where you're listening to a political discourse or debate, debate. When you're listening to um, people argue against one another, or maybe you're arguing. Usually. The fallacies that are committed, these informal fallacies, are going to be fallacies of relevance. Um, they're not going to be relevant to the topic. Again, we're not arbitrarily choosing to just, let's look at the fallacies of relevance section. These are where we're going to get the most mileage. Again, ambiguity, equivocation. Yeah, you'll, we can pick those up. Those are there. But these are straight up, often used, <laughs> most often used, utilized, uh, sadly, in argumentation. So this is where we're queuing in on. With our first example, argumentum ad baculum. Something like that. And but they're easy to just continually make up as the centuries go by. But for say, and because again, he identified the most popular types of them, we'll just kind of concentrate or at least center around those. Now, argument ad baculum, argumentum ad baculum, appeal to force. What do you think is an example of that? Thank <laughs> you. 
How about you'll believe me or beat the freaking you out of you? How about that? Like, you'll do this or you'll see the backside of my hand? Like, does that mean that my conclusion was necessarily true? No. Right? Like, I'm, a, I'm forcing you to adopt or trying to get you to adopt the conclusion based on what? Right. Now, that's obvious. That's an obvious example of something not necessarily being true, right? But what's a more subtle example? But it's the same fallacy. How about I say, guys, you'll write this on your paper, or you'll get, how about a, how about a C minus for your grade today? That's an appeal to force, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the truthfulness of your what you're writing or not writing in your paper, right? Like, we'll probably, at some point in this class, and probably, right? And if I basically am like, look, you're going to write this way, or I'm going to give you a C minus, I'm sorry. What am I doing? Right, I'm just appealing to force. Right, but it's the, that's the same type of argument. If I say, you're going to do this, or I'm going to punch you in the back of the head, right? Now, there's a difference if you get a C because your paper's crappy, right? But if it's just because I don't like it and try to get you to change it because I don't agree with it, and then I have the power to hold you accountable for that, say like with a bad grade, that's just the what? That's just an argument about vacuum, right? Especially if I'm trying to say that I don't like your paper and it's therefore false and you need to change it because you're going to get a C. I haven't, I haven't disproven your conclusion, right? I'm just going after you and telling you to change it or else, right? We're not talking about if you get 4 plus 4 equals 15, right? And if you don't change it, you get a C. We're not talking about that. We're talking about if you disagree with some particular conclusion and you're trying to falsify that person's conclusion simply by the use of force. You haven't addressed whether or not their argument is true or false, whether or what they have, the content of their paper is true or false. You're just appealing to this fallacy or you're appealing to force to get the situation changed or to disqualify their argument. That's an argument to my back one. Right? Anybody want to give their own example of that maybe? Maybe even a better example? No? All right. Now, this is one of the most popular. This is what, like, there's there's two or three that you'll hear at least, if not on a daily basis, at least once a week. At least once, in, once a week. In fact, this one is so popular, it's even made its way into the common vernacular. Even a lot of people that haven't even taken philosophy know this this particular uh, argument just because they've heard it so many times or they, it's so popular. So an argumentum ad hominem. And that just means, again, a slide for against the man. What's an example of that? I'm basic, like, right, right. Something like that, like, right, because that doesn't have anything to do with what? Right, and they may be an idiot, right? But they may not be voting for her because they're an idiot, right? And vice versa. Somebody may be voting for Trump. They may be an idiot, right? But they may not what? Like. They may have some other principled reason, right? You see how that's just so popular. What's another one? What's an, what's an, what's an example we hear all the time? All right, let's pick on me. Say, you know, you know, my first friend of philosophy class, you know, living there, and this guy. Dude, you know he's not going to know anything about freedom philosophy. He talks like that. He's got a southern accent. What can he possibly know? He probably likes barbecue, fried chicken, and collard greens. What is he going to know? What is he going to know about philosophy and Socrates when he sounds like we're, you know, in high school and, you know, home ed? You see what I'm saying? But what kind of argument is that? Nothing to do with my educational criteria, right? Nothing to do with what? Grade point average, you know, my project, innocent. nothing to do with that, right? But that stuff's persuasive. Why is that persuasive? Why is that persuasive? Now we're getting into psychology, right? I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know why I'm persuasive. <laughs> but, but it is. It's unbelievably persuasive is it not right it shouldn't be but is it yeah now another one is let's give another example one one that you might fall for especially if you grew up you know in an athletic sort of environment where i grew up there's a little town 
not far from where I live called Mount Zion. I think there's another one here in the metro that we're somewhere. It's huge. I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about this one has like 15 people and, and like a goat is the mayor of the town, maybe. All right, so let's say, like the high school there is tiny, right? And so let, let's say where I, where I grew up, where I went to high school is Carrollton. And Carrollton has just a historic, you know, kind of, you know, legendary football program at Carrollton. And so, like, the colleges used to play at Carrollton's field because it's just nicer than the colleges. That's how much stock was in the football program at Carrollton. So, let's say that Carrollton needs a new head coach, right? New football head coach. They go, somebody's driving through, you know, Bumbleville, and they go and they land in Mount Zion, and the goat greets them at the entrance. Hey! And then, so let's, let's say that they end up at the high school, 10 guys in the high school, right? And let's say that the, the superintendent of Carrollton says, you know what? This guy, we're giving this guy the job. And then people are like, what? You're giving the head coach and football job at Carrollton with 5,000 plus people in attendance every Friday night with the multi million dollar stadium. He's a head coach who's been coaching in a pasture. You're going to give that guy the head football job at Carrollton. Are you kidding me? What could he possibly know about football if he's been at that little humble hole, the mayor, but the mascot of the team? What would people say? Like, yeah, what do you think? What are you guys thinking? But what is that? What is that? It's just an art, ad, hom ad hominem, and then it's just a variation of ad hominems against the man and circumstantial line. Because the dude might know about what? He might be a freaking football genius, right? Right, right. And it is kind of an assumption, right? There's just a name for that. It's a mistake. It's a lapse in reason. And this is, again, Aristotle saw these things and gave them names. So let's say that Aristotle was sitting in Georgia, <laughs> you know, listening to this, and he's like, hey, all these people were persuaded by that. That has nothing to do with that guy's credentials. Right, that guy, if you sit down and talk to him, may what? He may know all, he may be a football God of some sort, right? It has nothing to do with where that's just completely circumstantial, right? What's a popular, what's another popular thing? What's another popular one that maybe you've even been fooled by? Because at home, circumstantial is around the circumstances, right? That guy's circumstances, the town he's in, the crappy football program, they, they play in a pasture, right? That's the circumstances. That one's not specifically against him, like the one about me, like because I have an accent, right? Now, what might be another example of the circumstantial stuff? Mitchell, what's one of you've heard? Right, and, and some stereotypes might fall into that, right? If you're trying to prove some conclusion, right? If you're trying to prove a certain conclusion, that might fall into it. What were you going to say? Well, I'm not definitely not <laughs> When people say like, oh, the council is going to be a big place to put the money into the If that by itself is the reason, if that by itself is the reason, then yes, that's ad circumstantial. Because he may be. He, he, right. Now, if now again, by itself, but if you combine that with other things, that might be a different argument. Flat out. Right, by itself, right? Because then you just disqualify who? George Washington. He's a former, right? So that by itself, again, like we see, we can see counterexamples to say that doesn't necessarily follow, that doesn't logically follow, right? Something like that. But yeah, that's a good example. <clears throat> What's another, does anybody have another example? Now let's go to this one very quickly. Just because this is another, these are, the reason what I'm really trying to get through these and we'll go. Is because these are your top two in the rest of these uh, Monday. It's going to be very similar to your ad hominem circumstantial. Genetic fallacy is just to say that some conclusion is wrong because they believe it for a certain reason. Does that make sense? This is a very popular fallacy. When you try to disqualify a belief or an ideology based upon its origins, its genetic genesis, right? Um, the beginning of some particular belief, some particular ideology, and you try to disqualify it based on that. This is a very popular fallacy that's used 
all the time. Pay attention. Remember the other days, the other day when we talked about up here, like if you hold a particular belief because your mama told you that, is that a good reason to end up self? Not necessarily, right? Why? Because other people's mamas may have told them whatever, right? Someone says, oh, the reason you're a fundamentalist Baptist is because you were raised in the South and everybody believes that. Does that mean it's false? Nope. Right? Doesn't mean it's false. It still may be true. Why? Because the reason you came to believe something has what? Nothing to do with, with the truth or truthfulness of the position, right? And we see how that works in reverse. Why? What if I what if I say, oh well, you're an atheist because you were raised by atheist parents? Genetic fallacy. It's still atheism what? It still may be true, right? Just because you were raised with a certain belief, or just because you came to a belief in the most absurd way fashion, false. No. The belief still may be true, right? So what right? It's just a step as again, is this a fallacy of relevance? Right. It just that your the charge, the genetic fallacy, has nothing to do with the relevance. Or let's say that someone says that, um, oh, well, uh, for instance, okay, look, what is our, what is based uh, cellular biology based on now? Roughly the model of who? A monk who had a vision of a reptile eating itself in a snake, right? Cellular biology. That's how he came up with the idea, the basic idea of those, of, of, of those biological cellular structures, right? But what are they still? They're true. Even though what got him started on that was a nut bad crazy dream. It's true. It's still true, right? Because that has nothing to do with whether the position is true or false. So you hear politicians, you know, all the time. Oh, my, my opponent believes this because of blah, 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 blah. Well, I mean, his position is false. You've got to, the point is this. You've got to address what? The issue. The argument, right? Whatever somebody's espousing, whatever their belief system is, whatever they're trying to get across, whatever the guy wants to be a football coach from wherever, you've got to address what? The reason that we're, we want to point these, these fallacies out is because all fallacies are what? Distractions away from what? The real issue is the issue. So, for instance, we talk about God's existence. The issue is what? Does God exist, Right? It doesn't matter if uneducated people believe in God or educated people believe in God. It doesn't matter if uneducated people are atheists or educated people are atheists, right? What kind of fallacy is that? It's irrelevant, right? And so this is true in any regard, whatever someone's political position is. Is what you're saying, are you committing a genetic fallacy? Are you committing an ad hominem type fallacy? Or are you addressing the issue on the merits of what? The issue. Right? Almost no one, this is why this stuff is so rhetorically powerful, because it's easier to attack the person, attack the circumstance, attack the person's background, attack the person's whatever, than actually attack what? That's right. So let's look on this. It's actually easier to do that. It's easier to go after that than to go after what? The argument or the issue. The argument. All right, so let's continue this next time. Good class, guys, even though I know that was probably our most boring class. All right, so that's just a, again, we just are finally getting into these fallacies. If you look back at the slides, we've only got two or three that we've jumped into. So the whole next lecture, we're just dealing with just these fallacies. Um, that should be a lot more fun, more interesting. Hopefully, uh, we will uh, avoid these in future, future usage, right? Um, but we're probably going to recognize that we've fallen for these fallacies um, uh, prior to today. And, <clears throat> and sadly, we've probably used some of these fallacies as we've tried to persuade or make arguments. We want to avoid that. So we'll check these out next time in our philosophy class. See you guys.